All right. Good morning, everyone. Come on. Where's your Saturday energy? Come on. Good morning, everyone. Woo! Yes. So that's the um, community day energy. Thank you so much. And um, now we're going to do a, a quick recap, uh, right? And then Steve will introduce what is uh, what this session is all about, and all those wow experience that he uh, had. Come on, Steve. You have it. <laughs> and then we're going to go through some of the services, not all, just some of the highlights that we both think is going to be uh, really cool for us to share with all of you. All right, so I give it to Steve. Yep, okay. Thank you, Johnny. So i um, just like to uh, go, go through the talk uh, that we have over here. So t today we're actually going to be talking about reInvent uh, 2022, uh, the recap, top highlights, top announcements. Right? And also, we will tell you more about what reInvent is if you have no idea what reInvent. So uh, just to introduce myself again, I'm Steve. Right? I am an AWS community hero. I run a user group in Singapore. Donnie over there, he's a principal developer advocate. No, no, no. My official title for today is Steve Fran. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Did, you, did you change the order? I changed the order. Why? Okay, because so it follows my order. <laughs> All right. Okay. So. So yes, he is, a, he is a, a very prominent guy. If you look at the blogs, if you see all his conf uh, conferences and stuff like that. And he also likes to be known as my friend. I'm not too sure the other way around. But it's my official let's, title. Let's see. It's just happened on a day-to-day -day basis. I work at AWS. Okay. okay. Yeah. So really, uh, reInvent. Maybe just a show of hands. How many of you know what is reInvent? Put up your hand. Okay, so it sounds like the other half don't really know what's reInvent, right? Okay, so this is what this section is really for. So reInvent is the premier technical conference organized by Amazon Web Services every single year, right? And it's uh, always held in Vegas. Uh, last year was actually in November 27 to 1st December. 2,000 technical sessions, not sales sessions, technical sessions, right? 50,000 attendees. Uh, in Vegas, it's always crowded. It's crazy. And most importantly, for people who are interested in announcements, that's where Christmas comes. All the announcements for the new announcements that they're going to launch. So really, it's just a big conference. Many people are just all coming together uh, with in-person content and also free virtual content that you can find online later on. So the, the, always the highlight of any reInvent, like any Apple keynote, right? You know, with product launches, right? In the Amazon world, you have the big three keynotes. Uh, that is uh, with Adam Serlipsky, Swami, and uh, Dr. Werner. You know, they all give different announcements every, uh, every day during the conference itself. So this is where uh, they will announce new features. Some of it gets pushed to the top, some maybe not so much. Right? But that's where everyone listens out for the keynotes because that's where all the interesting stuff is going to be uh, announced on that site. Yep. And it's not just really a, a technical conference. right? A conference that you come together just learning is not exactly maybe the best experience or so. Really, the idea here is community. Community coming together, learning together, networking together, having fun together, you know, that is really the benefit of a conference like reInvent and like this uh, conference that we have over here. So that is really just, uh, just reInvent. It's not just about learning. It's also about the meeting of people, the, 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 the melting of minds in that sense. Right? And if, uh, of course, this is a paid conference and really the best way to go for this uh, uh, is, you know, just join a company that can help you sponsor your... <laughs> Yeah, because it's not cheap to go there from Singapore. Okay, yeah. So now we really want to go through the top announcements. And uh, we are not going to go through this wall of text, okay? But what we are trying to highlight here, right, is that there are a lot of announcements in various categories. Um, uh, definitely, if you are from different walks of life, you are developer, DevOps, networking, security, even a uh, uh, CX level, level itself, right? All these announcements will be uh, exciting and different for you itself, right? So if you really look, this is uh, what all the top announcements have been. Three slides. Actually, there's more than this, right? 
but we're not going to go through this with you because we think it's boring, right? But what we really want to go through with you, uh, we, we believe that most of the crowd here is uh, developer, maybe DevOps focus, and, and this is where I want to pass the time to Johnny because he will actually be going through the highlights uh, of, of uh, what we're going to be presenting today and also with demos for some of the announcements that we are going to be talking a lot more on. So, Donny, please. Yep, thank you. All right, so as Steve mentioned, there are a lot of stuff announced at Rainvent, uh, starting from new services, new features, um, and then the, way, the wall of text that you just saw, uh, the three slides, uh, they are the highlights. So what we're going to do here is to pick you some highlights of the highlights. And we break it down into uh, three categories. The first one is uh, builder experience. Uh, those services that emphasize on uh, development on AWS for us as a builder and developers. The second category is more on data and analytics, right? And then lastly, what is the last one? The other highlights. So, we, because there are so many stuff, uh, we try to cram it down. Okay, so first question to all of you Do you want me to talk more or you want me to give you d more demos? More talk or more demos? Demos, cool. Right, so the first of is AWS Application Composer. So, um, remember when, when before, before the cloud era, I mean up until now, um, when, whenever I want to build an application, I start by designing on a diagram. Right, so who, uh, which one of you is still using that? Using diagram to build architecture? Right, right, right. So most of us, we're still doing that. But now, uh, imagine that you have this kind of like a canvas, the diagram canvas with steroid, right? What does it mean? It means that whenever you, what you put into that diagram, it will give you the, uh, um, the ISC, or you can build infrastructure directly from, this, um, the, from that diagram. And that is what a AWS Application Composer. So AWS Application Composer is very straightforward. So this is how it looks like. Yeah. Right. Uh, if I put it here. Right, so this is AWS Application Composer. Uh, it's currently in preview. Um, so uh, there were going to be some changes uh, while we getting like a feedback from, de uh, from developers like you. Um, so I'm going to like uh, do uh, open the demo. And what's really cool about Application Composer is not only that you can drag and drop all the services, serverless services from the, uh, from, from the the com from the left pane into the canvas, but it also has this ability to connect on or sync with your uh, IDE. So if I choose here, and then I'm going to create a new folder, like temporary, I'm going to select here. Right. It's going to create like, oh. Yeah, so now what, I'm go what, what is happening in the background is that everything that I uh, create on this canvas is going to be reflected on my files. Right, so I'm going to open my files. Where is the documents? Good. Uh, composer. And there you go. So this is re really cool stuff because uh, as you made your changes here, like if you want to add another DynamoDB table, is going to, and then you want to add some kind of like a connector, or you want to create another S3. This is something that you can do in AWS Application Composer. And then if you go to this step, uh, template, you all have this, uh, the same uh, serverless template that you can just change, and then you can like deploy it using SAM CLI. Right. So that is AWS Application Composer. Now, the uh, next one will be uh, Amazon Code Catalyst. Uh, Amazon Code Catalyst is also in preview. And have you heard about this Amazon Code Catalyst? Cool. Right, so I also have the, I also got this T-shirt from uh, Amazon Code Catalyst uh, team. Um, so it's kind of cool. Uh, it it, it kind of like a personal obligation for me to present Code Catalyst. But it's some, it's, this is really cool um, because with Code Catalyst, the idea is to, it's going to be your unified development hub. 
Look, like for example, uh, whenever we do development, we have our uh, code uh, Git repo, right? And then we use another tool to implement CI CD, right? And then we use uh, like, a, like a GitHub or like a Git version control repository service to maintain the issues of doing the project management. And we also use another tool to uh, create like a report, like a what, uh, your unit test report, uh, your uptime report, and all of those stuff. So imagine all of those components into one single service, and that is um, Amazon called Catalyst. So you can see here, uh, this is a sample project that I deployed, and you can see all these components, like for starting from repositories, uh, CI/CD also baked inside into Amazon Code Catalyst, which is really amazing. Um, and then you can see the open pull requests, uh, and then issues uh, for uh, assigned to you or created by you. So you have this full visibility on what's going on in that kind of uh, repository. But something that's really cool that I really uh, like from Code Catalyst is that um, it will give you a different uh, environment. You have this flexibility to configure your application environment. Let's say that you have staging, you have production environment, and then it also reflects on your dev environments. Let's say you want to do, you want to like uh, create a, a pull request, or you want to work on new features. You can create your development environments, and then you can like just go to uh, you can uh, you can just it has a nice integration with Visual Studio Code which really minimize the friction to, to like a start up a new uh, IDE or development environment. So you just need to like a go uh, to the code catalyst, click few buttons, and there you have it. This is the repo that I use uh, for the medical misfit. So it has a really nice uh, integration. Right, uh, so that is Amazon Code Catalyst. Um, right, so moving on. So Donny, yep. just just a quick question, right? Yep. So with Code Catalyst, do you need an AWS account then? Oh, well, that's a really good question. So this is something that we introduce um, at Rainfan as well. So it's called AWS Builder ID, right? So with AWS Builder ID it means that it gives you a federated way on accessing AWS services, and that includes uh, Code Catalyst. So with, uh, with Code Catalyst that you can easily create your builder ID and then um, all those like repos, issues and all services is going to be hosted in one account. So that means that you can invite uh, collaborators and then just provide them with the uh, development environment and then you can start working together. Okay. Right. So and then uh, one thing that I really like about Code Catalyst is that um, if if you are in the organization, right? If you're in the organization and you want to standardize the development environment, if you want to standardize the requirements for your project, this is a really cool way to do that. Right. Okay, so next one is Amazon Code Whisperer. Um, how many of you have heard about this? Cool. So, uh, Amazon Code Whisperer, um, as it says, it uh, generates code recommendation. Uh, it, you can use Python, you can use Java, JavaScript, C Sharp, TypeScript, and, um, and it has a nice integration with IDE as well. You can use Visual Studio Code, you can use IntelliJ, you can use PyCharm, you can also use AWS Cloud9 and AWS Lambda. And the way it works for Amazon Code Whisperer is that it really depends on uh, it, it really depends on what kind of uh, sorry. This one, right? It really depends on what kind of IDE that you want to use Code Whisperer. Like, if you want to use AWS Cloud9 or AWS Lambda directly into the code editor, you just need to enable IAM. Now, but if you want to integrate with uh, Visual Studio Code, like for example, uh, you 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 need to create a builder ID, something that I mentioned before. That's something that you're going to use with Amazon Code Catalyst. So with Builder ID, you will have this uh, access to Code Whisperer as well. Now, what is really cool about Code Whisperer, I'm not sure if this is too small, right? So let's say that I want to, um, I want to create a function uh, about creating a, creating a, saving a data into DynamoDB, right? Just for example. Hmm? Zoom in. Oh. 
Okay, so I'm going to up, up. I'm going to put it down. Yeah. I said I want to create a function to save data uh, into DynamoDB. And then let's say that I want to uh, with following attributes. So what's going to do is that uh, you can see it's it's give uh, us the recommendation. Uh, let's say that I want to name it the safe data, uh, good enough. And then I can also like uh, uh, this one one example. I can get the recommendation from based on the comment that I just uh, type in. Right. So that's cool. Now. Another cool thing about Codewiz Pro is that let's say that you are working um, uh, in like uh, libraries with libraries or with frameworks like pandas, like Flask. Uh, in this case, like let's say that I want to create um, a function uh, to perform data frame uh, for to write a data frame uh, from CSV, just like that, right? Oops. So there you go. So it, not, it doesn't only work for, uh, for AWS services, but it also works for popular frameworks. You can use Pandas, you can use um, Flask, or even if you want to have like a uh, building of machine learning workloads, you can also use like a, um, like a PyTorch using uh, Code Whisperer as well. But something that I really want to highlight in the, um, oops. In Amazon Code Whisperer, is that it also has a built-in feature to run uh, to check your, the security of your codes. Right. Let's say that you building an integration with API, you put some like uh, keys and secrets, and you want to uh, make sure there's nothing um, like no, no credentials you're going to share into your GitHub repo. Right, so you can just run the security scan. This is something that I really like, and I usually like to do it before I uh, make a comment into my Git repo. Right, so that is uh, Amazon Code Whisperer. Okay, so uh, next one is Amazon Event Bridge Pipes. Right, those. This is really well for me. This is a highlight. Like a, this is a highlight of uh, AWS Rain Fan um, because it let like, it really helps uh, me as a developer to integrate service uh, from uh, from AWS services, and then I can make like some kind of, like a transformation, and then I can uh, modify the payload into the target destination. Right. So what Amazon Event Bridge Pipe does is that it removes the need to write a glue code if you want to connect from one surface to another surface. Like for example, how many of you using Amazon SQS? Right. How many of you using step functions? How do you connect the, uh, these two? What? See. Now that is the that is the, one of the problem that uh, going to be addressed by Amazon Event Bridge Pipes. Now. Amazon Event Bridge uh, was introduced a couple of years ago. It was the evolution of CloudWatch events. And, um, and last year, we also announced, and this is way before Rain Fan, uh, it was uh, called Amazon Event Bridge Scheduler. So to let you know that Amazon Event Bridge is a family now because it has three services. The first one is the event bus. Which that you can um, is, you can build your event-driven application by using uh, Amazon Event Bridge Event Bus. The second uh, service, which was announced around November, it was called uh, Event Bridge Scheduler. So Amazon Event Bridge Scheduler, you can the way, the way that I like to think about it is like it's a cron tab with steroid. Right, so you can you can you can use your um, like a scheduling uh, rules to initiate the event or trigger any kind of events uh, with Amazon Event Bridge. Now this is the uh, the last and the most recent service for Amazon Event Bridge is called Pipe. So let me show you how it looks like. Right, Amazon Event Bridge Pipes. Let's see. Okay, so um, is it too small? No. Okay, so this is pipes. 
So with Amazon Event Bridge Pipes, you can define source, and then you can fill, and then this source is going to be the producer of the events. And then these events that you can do filtering. So that, that helps you to only process the events that you need, and also reduce the cost, because uh, Event Bridge Pipes only charge you for the events that is going to be processed. Right? And then you can also do enrichment. Let's say that you got a payload and you, want, you have an existing Lambda functions, or you, have an, um, you want to connect with external SaaS API, that you want to enrich your payload, that you can do that as well. And then you can wrap everything, uh, and then you can also do like a transforming your events and before it goes to the target destination. Now, it's really that simple. Let me show you how it, how it looks like. So this is pipes, right? Um, I have 25 minutes, so I'm not going to do like a, the live demo. But essentially, this is an integration between SQS that I have, right? And then I also have a step functions. Now, whenever I pass the uh, event uh, to Amazon SQS, it's going to be processed by step function. It's really uh, as easy like that. But what's really amazing about Amazon Event Bridge is that the integration with various services that you can choose. Like for example, you can use Kinesis, SQS, DynamoDB, uh, Amazon MQ, right? And this is really interesting. Self-managed Apache Kafka. So let's say that you already uh, you are running Kafka uh, for your application, and um, and then you want to integrate, you want to have this kind of like. Um, like uh, ingesting all the events from Kafka into your application that you can use Amazon Event Bridge uh, pipe as well. Um, so yeah, so it's really as simple as that. Like you can send the message, everything will go through uh, Amazon Event Bridge pipe, and then it's going to be received by Amazon, uh, sorry, AWS Step Functions, right? And then it's going to uh, being locked by uh, these CloudWatch logs. Right. So yeah, so the idea of Amazon Event Bridge Pipes is just to make it easier for you to create like a, like a pipe, like a channel to integrate one surface to another surface. Right. I see, I, I, I can sense Steve has a question for me. So Donny, with, with this uh, feature, right, mm. is there any more need for any edge case to write some form of glue code between all those services that you just mentioned? So I will say no. As long as the source is those are supported by event bridge pipes, which you can see from the list is quite uh, it's quite many, and then the target list actually is um, it has more uh, supported services, and what's really amazing about Amazon event bridge pipes is that you can also integrate like with external third party API, right? So each step that you see, uh, excluding the the filtering. You can also like if you let's say if you want to augment your data with the data that you have on Salesforce, right? you can do that as well. So, so it's really like like consolidating the um, the event into pipes. Does that make sense? Cool. Right. So moving on. Um, oh, we're not supposed to run this, right? <laughs> right. Okay. So. <laughs> So this is um, um, we, we we're not supposed to present this, but I think I accidentally uh, unhide this slide. But this is a really cool service. You want to have some? No, no, no. I think you should go ahead. Okay, you have shown so. the crowd, so you can't disappoint them now. <laughs> okay. All right. So how many of you working in advertising and marketing industry? Okay. Good, we have a couple of you working in um, ads and marketing industry, so at least that we have somebody who probably like really keen to know about this. Now, uh, clean rooms, let's, let's start with clean rooms. The um, clean rooms is actually a technology to help uh, collaboration, to bridge collaboration between one party and another party. Right. So let's say, let's imagine that we, you are working in the ads and marketing industry, and you and you, have, you are running a social media campaign, and you also have a client who is running a campaign. campaign. Let's say that I'm an airline, I run a campaign, and I work together with a third party um, company to run my social media campaign. Right? So, but we know that we should collaborate, but we don't want to refill our data. Right? 
So, so that is the issue. That means that we, need, we understand the need that we need to collaborate, but we don't want to share the underlying raw data. Now, that is a technology called clean rooms. So with uh, clean rooms, uh, it helps you to collaborate without sharing raw data. And then more importantly, that you can define your own restriction. Let's say that you have a table and you have like a specific columns that you don't want to share to the others or you want to allow some sort like a scalar functions the, for any kind of query into this uh, database, right? So that's something that you can do with uh, clean room. So uh, and I, don't, I do have a demo on this, but I'm not sure that, uh, right. So you want me to do a demo on this? Yeah, cool, cool. Um, so let's say that Okay, so this is the clean room. So I want to open. So it requires, like, I mean, this demo requires like a two uh, accounts. The first one is the initiator who create the collaboration and the other one who contributes with their data sets. Now, I already have um, these uh, collaborations. It's a membership. So the idea is that um, I have, uh, I'm, I'm an airline company. I'm running campaign. I want to see the progress of this campaign with the social media company. So I have, okay. so I have um, two members in this collaboration, myself as an airline, and Steve, who is the CEO of a social media company. Right? And then Steve in the social media companies already shared with me the tables that all, all resides in glue, uh, AWS Glue. You can see here, this is from my side. Um, so yeah, so you can see that I have like, uh, uh, business traveler, uh, CD, this is all the columns, hash email, uh, name, state, uh, status, right? Now, so to, to show you what does it mean by it means that um, collaboration without uh, revealing underlying data. So what, what happened now is what I have is that everything is all residing in these uh, AWS clean rooms. I have the data from the social media company and I'll also share my data with social media company. Now, let's say that I want to select, um, like I want to find the emails of the um, customers or potential customers that has been participating in this particular campaign, right? So this is my query. I want to select a hash email, right? From social media company uh, data. And then if I run this, right? I can see that I cannot do that. Why? Because the hash email is not allowed in select query. Right. Now, but, and then on the social media company side, on Steve's side, he already defined all the tables, all the data, and then he also defined what can I do uh, as, a, as, the, as an airline company with his data. So he's, he said the um, aggregation only allow for aggregation um, query. So let's say that I want to just like a count how many people uh, that's, uh, that's, that's participating in this kind of uh, uh, campaign, right? And I mean, it's, it's, going to, it's going to provide me with the results. Right? Um, so, so yeah, so that is the uh, idea of AWS clean rooms. And then what's more really exciting about clean rooms is that it, it has the optional uh, encryption um, and then with this optional encryption, it can even enhance or protect your data from your site. So the way it works is that with this cryptographic computing um, security, uh, Steve can also define a key to protect his data, which is going to be like up really uh, unreadable from my end, but I can still query the data. So that is the idea. Uh, of uh, AWS uh, clean rooms to help you collaborate with other parties uh, without uh, uh, sharing uh, or like refilling the underlying raw data. Yeah. So Donny, uh, mm. I think I'm the CEO, right, of this social media company. So I'll ask a very dumb question. Okay. Right? <laughs> right. Uh, okay. So both of us must be AWS customers, right? Yes, correct. Okay. Yeah. So that was the only question I wanted to ask. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so uh, with, with Elder Screen Rooms, you, uh, you, you need to be, uh, have your data 
uh, and also already running uh, AWS accounts. So the way it works is that on the onboarding, um, let me see if I can just show it to you. So this, this is the, uh, the onboarding process. You can create collaborations, and then you need to define your member, your AWS account ID, right? And then you need to also define the AWS account ID for your members. You can also add up to five members. Because we already have two here, you can add more three members. So this is really good to do collaboration, right? So uh, moving on, uh, what is? What's next? I hope I don't unhide few <laughs> slides. <laughs> All right, so next one is top data and analytics highlights. Um, the first one will be, um, yeah, Amazon AppFlow. All right, so how many of you use Amazon AppFlow? Oh my goodness. Okay, one. Okay, I think we, we need to do more meetups talking about AppFlow. Right. <laughs> So, okay, so Amazon AppFlow is a, a fully managed service that helps you to transfer data from SaaS uh, application, like external SaaS application, to and from your AWS account, right? So that's easy as it sounds, right? How many of you use like an um, external um, third-party SaaS application, like Salesforce, Jira, Datadog, right? Um, Google Analytics, come on, come on. Come on, come on, see, see, right? So imagine that you have this kind of ability to grab those data from SaaS application into your AWS accounts, right? The way that we used to like, grab those data is by creating a custom code, like a custom application, and then we map all these fields from those uh, SaaS API data fields into our own database, right? And then we also need to maintain the um, API versioning. All right, and then we also need to maintain the uh, the frequency of this uh, of this uh, like uh, application when it runs, when it stops, when it needs to be timed out. Right? How if we need to define another schema, and that is what uh, Amazon AppFlow is. Amazon AppFlow it really helps you to like a uh, create an integration, creating a bridge, like a two-way sync for some of the connectors from SaaS API, third-party SaaS API into your AWS account. Now imagine that you can have those data sitting on your uh, SaaS, uh, third-party SaaS application into Amazon S3 or Amazon Redshift. It gives you all these uh, unified data, uh, like a data lake into your AWS account, so you can even enhance it further for your analytics, your BI reporting, or even for machine learning workloads. Right. So that is uh, Amazon AppFlow. But the real highlights is that now, Amazon AppFlow supports over 50 applications. Right. So that means that you now can have uh, integration with Facebook. You can have integration with Google Ads, Google Search Console, Instagram, LinkedIn, uh, MailChimp, SendGrid, Datadog, like many, many uh, connectors that you can integrate with uh, Amazon AppFlow. Right, so let me show you how it looks like. Oh, I always forgot to. Mm. Okay, so this is Amazon AppFlow, right? Um, yeah, this is Amazon AppFlow. This is the, uh, whenever you want to create like some kind of integration, it's called as Flow. So here you can see the, uh, you just need to connect your source and destination, and then you need to map source field to destination, add filters, and then you need to activate or run the flow. You can have it scheduled, or you can have it run manually. So it's really cool stuff, especially if you have uh, data sitting on third-party application. Now let me show you how it looks like if I want to create a flow. Like I want to, like, I'm not going to create a, a flow, but I just want to show you the source that you can choose. Now, once that you def, um, put a name for your uh, flow, now you have all of these integrations, right? And then, like for example, um, we have something, a, a connector from Trend Micro, which is really cool, and then. Uh, you, you need to uh, create the connection with this, uh, this SaaS application, and then you can also, you need to define like the destination, uh, destinations. You can see we have a manual list uh, on supported services to, um, to get those data from and to uh, third-party application. 
In this case, I choose Amazon S3, right? Well, this is really cool. Now, but the, another cool thing that we announced at reInvent is that it has a nice integration with AWS Glue Data Catalog. Now, now if you've been working uh, with AWS services and then you, um, I mean, I mean, you're working with AWS Glue, S3, Redshift, you probably knew where it's going to. So by, the, by having this kind of nice integration with AWS Glue Data Catalog, this means that you now have this kind of index of your, uh, index of your data sitting on AWS Glue that you can extend the use cases into another, um, another stage. Like for example, machine learning workloads. Now let's say you have this, all the data from third-party SaaS application and then you want to get it into your Amazon S3, build your own data lake, but at the same time, you also want to process uh, some of the services into, uh, into your machine learning pipelines. And you can do that because if you use the integration with AWS Glue Data Catalog, uh, you can use that um, data on Amazon SageMaker's uh, Data Wrangler. So um, it's, it's currently loading, but Data Wrangler is a service from, like a, it's a feature, to be honest, uh, from uh, Amazon SageMaker to help you uh, do data preparation. So once that you enable in the AWS Glue Data Catalog, you can import those data. Yeah, you can import those data. Like what you see, this is the same connectors that we see in AppFlow, right? So by having this, uh, so this is, so it was a new, uh, two new features uh, that I packaged in one uh, announcement that with uh, AppFlow, now you have this more flexibility in connecting uh, various SaaS applications and you have this nice integration if you want to build your machine learning workloads directly from SaaS uh, integration with AppFlow. All right. Right. Uh, Okay, so next up, you have any questions about that? I think that uh, really solves a lot of the heavy lifting. Because yeah. I mean, nowadays, most companies just use more SaaS and SaaS, right? Mm. And you know, of course, if you go up, uh, you know, maturity, you mm. want to bridge the data from all the sources, mm. you want to do data processing. I can see that I, I, I would use that definitely yep. or when I have that use case, yeah. right? I'm not going to write all those glue code. I don't want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, but so this is really useful. I mean. Um, when, when I heard about this AppFlow uh, integration with like a 50 plus connectors, I know that it's, we, it's going to be easy for us to build a data lake by simply having this AppFlow. Right, cool. So next up is Amazon Aurora Zero ETL integration. I guess. Um, so uh, this is currently in preview. Uh, so in short that now uh, with Amazon, o how many of you use Amazon Aurora? Cool. How many of you use uh, Redshift? Right. I should build a demo on this. All right. So with, with this kind, uh, with these new features, now you have a really nice integration between your Amazon Aurora and Amazon Redshift. What it means is that we, whenever you have a, a write data into your Amazon Aurora, it's going to be available as well into Amazon Redshift, like in near real time. So it, it removes away the, uh, the complexity on like a synchronizing uh, between from uh, Amazon Aurora and Amazon Redshift because with this NAS integration, you can just do it on the console. Right. So that's kind of a bit straightforward. Um, right. So next up is um, Amazon RDS, MySQL, uh, MariaDB, and Amazon Aurora. Uh, Amazon Aurora blue green deployments. So how many of you are dealing with database, uh, working with database in day to day basis, right? How many of you like uh, know this pain on like uh, migrating uh, database, migrating the version? How many of you uh, see, right? So 
uh, I'm happy to share with you uh, that now with these blue-green deployments, you don't need to manually create your, uh, your blue-green uh, infrastructure whenever you want to do database uh, operations. Like if you want to upgrade um, the um, major or minor patches or you want to uh, define a new schema, this is something that you can do directly from the console. So for those who haven't uh, really familiar with the blue-green deployment, um, it's a way that we could migrate from one uh, state to another state, to like a new state. So blue is actually the current production environment, and the green is actually the, uh, the staging environment that we're going to switch over the data once that the, the new uh, infrastructure is ready for us to use. Now, in the past, what we use uh, is the approach on like creating replica, and then we promote the replica, right? But we don't need to do that anymore because with this blue-green deployment, you can uh, like uh, easily switch uh, from uh, from from uh, the the current uh, state that you have into the new state. And what I really like about this feature is that you don't need to change any code, which is awesome. Because, uh, all of those, like a switching from redirecting the traffic from, uh, from blue to the grid environment is going to be uh, fully managed by RDS, going to be managed by this uh, blue-green deployment. All right. So, yeah. Donny, um, I, I, I think when I saw this announcement came up, I was actually quite happy because, mm -hmm. uh, um, I mean, in the past year, I had to deal with two end-of-life uh, our, our, our database upgrades and it was uh, always a nightmare right. but not as bad as uh, Oracle upgrades on-prem I tell you right so anyway so I will ask the elephant in the room yeah. where's Aurora Postgres next up we have Amazon VPC <laughs> <laughs> right, so thank you for your feedback, Steve. Um, yeah, we heard a lot. We got a, a lot of uh, feedback from customers that they you want also uh, this integration with Postgres. Uh, my answer is that keep uh, stay in touch with AWS CC Group Singapore. Uh, we're going to give you like uh, the updates whenever is there any support available for Postgres. Okay, we are safe. <laughs> Right, so next up is Amazon VPC Lattice. This is super cool. Um, so well, the VPC Lattice, it really simplifies the way that we connect our surface, uh, our surface sitting in, uh, let, let's say, in different subnets. So for example, I don't have any demos on this. Uh, I do have a demos, but uh, I would just want to like, uh, uh, share a bit about this uh, in this recap. Let's say that you have an application running on EC2 on subnet A, and you also have um, a Lambda function uh, running on uh, different uh, VPC, uh, and then you want to connect this from this uh, EC2 to this Lambda. You want to call an like, HTTP API. Right. With uh, VPC Lattice, you can do that. Well, uh, the way it works is that it's going to create the, um, like a, the net, the, an extra networking layer that will give you the, uh, the, the DNS uh, address that you can call. So it supports HTTP 1, HTTP 2, uh, HTTP, HTTPS with, TL, uh, with TLS as well, and also gRPC. Right? So it, it really helps you to build that kind of connectivity, cross-account, uh, cross-VPC connections to services. Now, I will not, uh, but if you are interested in uh, working with Amazon VPC Lattice, I really suggest you to go to Boomi's presentation when he's going to talk a lot about uh, the use cases on Amazon VPC Lattice. And also, I almost forgot to mention that if you want to uh, learn more about uh, Event Bridge and how cool these uh, applications to, for you to uh, build asynchronous or even driven application, I really suggest you to go to Sonu um, uh, Talk. There you are. Uh, he's going to share, like, um, uh, elaborate more use cases with, um, with, with uh, architecture about how you can use Amazon EventBridge. Right. All right, so I think that's all, um, Steve. So I mean, these are all the announcements, but really, I mean, it's really just to dig the depths, and uh, if you really want to find out more,
just look through the uh, like this one is from the from the blocks, right? Yep. I think most of you all who are familiar with all the announcements, you would know that this this exists. So uh, yeah, so just uh, go and search and Google for it, uh, and then I think that's the next one or so. Yep. Right. YouTube, all the sessions from reInvent, it's all free. Just go for it. Right. Yeah. And also, uh, if anyone is interested on using the um, uh, these, those announcements or those services that is in preview, and uh, you really want to have that kind of access, just reach out to me, and I probably can help you to include you into the uh, waitlist. Like, if you want to try, uh, like what else, like a code whisper or the uh, like a limited preview on blue green things like that, just let me know. All right. So. Uh, thank you so much, everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Oh, I'm pretty sure that you are going to have much more fun in the upcoming sessions. So, and, and yeah, I think that's all from me. <laughs>